How we doing? How we doing? This is Destination Denver, Colorado, and today, for better or worse, let me explain Denver, Colorado to you, starting right now. All right, this is Destination Denver, Colorado. I'm your host, Jimmy Everett. And listen, if you're interested in learning all the ins and outs, pros and cons to moving to or around Denver, Colorado, then this is a channel for you. So that subscribe button and notification icon you see on your screen, make sure you click on that as I'm dropping new videos for you each and every week. And as much as I try to be a little creative and educational here on camera, I'm also a licensed mortgage broker covering the entire state of Colorado and team with some of Denver's most talented realtors. And we are helping people move here each and every day. So the number and email you see on your screen know that I am always the person answer your phone calls, answer your texts, answer your emails there when and if you need me. Now that we have that fun-filled stuff out of the way, let's get to what we're here for. And that is, let me explain, better or worse, Denver, Colorado to you. So whether you are familiar with my channel or not, I can tell you I attempt in every video to be unbiasedly biased about Denver, Colorado. At the end of the day, I'm a Colorado native with the exception of eight years away in the Navy and another four years away working in broadcast journalism. I've been here the majority of my life, living most of those years in Lakewood, Colorado, about 15 to 20 minutes west of Denver. So understanding that I love Denver and I know that it has a lot going for it, I also understand that there are issues in Denver, current, plural, issues in Denver, some of them not improving, some of them actually getting worse. So the objective in today's video is to share a little bit of where Denver has been, where we currently are, and where myself, clients, colleagues, and experts think we are going, good, bad, or indifferent. The key goal of this video today is to share with you information that will either perhaps entice you to move or confirm the idea that Denver isn't right for you. So let's get a brief history lesson in Denver and really some key steps that got us to where we are here. So, so to give you the super basics, Denver is founded in 1858, named after James W. Denver, the Kansas Territory Governor. It's founded by a bunch of gold rush settlers moving west. And Denver is originally nothing but farmland, mining, and it becomes a railroad hub. The railroads figured that Denver was a kind of your gateway to the Rockies. You're right there on the front range and it's not dead center in the United States, but pretty close. So it was a great hub for railroads. Early on, most of the population is white. Uh, eventually you start to see a lot more Hispanics and Latinos move into the area and the black population starts to grow in an area called Five Points. Hipsters today will call it Rhino and you might see it called Rhino on Google Maps, but it was called Five Points. Locals still call it Five Points. And Five Points was for a period of time coined the Harlem of the West. And I joke in plenty of videos that for a long time, Denver was a cow town. I say that because you could leave downtown Denver and within 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes, you might not see a cow, but you would certainly see like a horse ranch. And that was the case and, and still in certain directions is up until realistically the mid to late 90s getting into 2000s. And there's a few things that happen in the 90s that really start moving Denver along as far as growth. The first is in 1995, Denver opens Denver International Airport. Up until that time, we had Stapleton, a small, pretty domestic airport, didn't have international travel. And so DIA, Denver International Airport, is this massive airport, this massive undertaking, at the time had technology that was you know, state of the art, and it really puts Denver on the map for travel. Next, you had, still in the 90s and getting into 2000s, you had a tech boom in Denver. A lot of companies moving here, a lot of companies being founded in Colorado, and you have areas like the Denver Tech Center, which is in Greenwood Village, located south of Denver, that starts to be developed. Up until then, you really just had this small city of Denver with its few skyscrapers, nothing really else, but the Tech Center starts to be developed at that time, and that really starts bringing more people and more opportunity to Denver. 
But to me, the, the biggest thing that occurred to Denver, at least in my lifetime, as far as the impact on the geography and the, and the build out of this city was the arrival of the Colorado Rockies, the world's greatest minor league baseball team to be allowed to play major league baseball in 1993. So in 1993, the Colorado Rockies arrived. For the first couple years, they played their games at Mile High Stadium, same place at the time as the Denver Broncos. But during that time, Coors Field, their current ballpark, was being constructed in lower downtown Denver or as we call it now Lodo and once that was done Denver really had and lower downtown had this huge revitalization up until that time you didn't really go downtown for a lot you didn't go down there for many restaurants you didn't go down there for bars or clubs there really wasn't a lot to do Denver wasn't the type of city that you went out to at night there just wasn't a lot but with the Rockies and specifically with Coors Field being open, all of a sudden you had bars, restaurants, hotels, all sorts of amenities built around Coors Field and in lower downtown. And so for probably a decade plus, uh, Market Street, which is the road that runs right along Coors Field, became the hub, the center of nightlife in all of Denver. And that really started to expand out. Once Market was it was in place and all of these uh, amenities all these places to go that really started to bring nightlife restaurants and things of that nature to denver and of course we can't talk about colorado without skipping ahead to 2012 when colorado decides to become one of the first states in the union to legalize marijuana for recreational use for a time colorado was called the amsterdam of the west i don't know if we still are uh, and it still can be a big deal multiple states have legalized it since but we still get a, a lot of tourist uh, attraction from that and we will talk about the economic impacts that that has had good, bad, or indifferent there's a lot to like a lot to not like about it uh, but that being one of those big steps and the most recent real shift, and this was seen nationwide, but really impacted Denver, was uh, you know during 2020, 2021, interest rates really low. Uh, you saw home prices in the Denver metro area skyrocket. Most areas 20% or greater in appreciation, and that really changed the affordability of Denver. Up until that point, Denver was already moving towards a pretty expensive place to live, and that really catapulted it. And we saw that in some of the most desirable metro areas of the most desirable communities nationwide Denver was certainly one of those so where does Denver stand today well well currently to give you a basis of our our demographics and what type of people live here Denver is for the most part a young city 62 and a half percent as of the most recent census 62 and a half percent of the population of the Denver metro area is below the age of 45 it's 44 or below I'm 45, so I'm out of that 62.5%. What can I say? However, luckily I do count in the next group. So 79.7%, basically eight out of 10 people living in Denver are 59 years of age or under. So you really see uh, a lot of youth movement. Now granted, that does include kids, babies on up, but still 80% of your population, 59 and below. What's that going to tell you? It's also going to tell you that a large amount of our population is still in the working force. That's part of our economic basis here in Denver. From a diversity standpoint, and listen, before the commenters say it, I, I, I speak diversity specific from the census. I understand that diversity is not specifically just color. Uh, however, for the sake of sharing statistics, the Denver metro area currently consists of roughly 55% white, 29% Hispanic and Latino, 9% black, and 4% Asian. What I found extremely interesting, and being as my wife is Venezuelan and fluent in Spanish, is that 30% of the Denver metro area is bilingual. I am once again outside of that circle, but I'm working on it. And you'll hear this a lot, Denver metro is also a very educated area. What I mean by that? So in Denver, just shy of 49% of the population of the Denver Metro has a bachelor's degree or greater. In comparison, the national average is a little over 33%. So you will feel that in the economy. You'll feel that from a competitive standpoint. And to some extent, that doesn't mean that you know, having a bachelor's or having a master's puts you above and beyond because there are certain industries and certain positions where there's an oversaturation of these degrees because of how much education uh, there seems to be in Denver. I should say how many educated people, but you know, I just like to word things incorrectly to show you how educated I am. 
Uh, from a housing standpoint, uh, really no shocker here. Ownership in Denver is, is a little more than half, 50.4% as of, again, the most recent census. That leaves 49.6% that rent. Uh, and, and again, no shocker there, but it really does tie into the affordability challenges of Denver and how much of a stretch it has become for one or even at times two individuals to team up to buy a home. The Denver economy, you know, if you talk about the early 2000s into, into the early 2010s, you're going to talk about a community that was really reliant on oil and gas. Tech companies were here, but if you were talking the highest paying jobs, that was going to be oil and gas. That has really evolved. As these tech companies have grown, you see a lot of tech, finance, education, healthcare, and oil and gas is still sprinkled in. And certainly service industry plays a big role in the Denver community as well. And within that service industry, hospitality, things of that nature, all gonna be related and intertwined. When it comes to the health and leisure of Denver, Colorado, I mean, look outside and you'll see it. We talk all the time about getting out, whether it is to the mountains, whether it is to the mini parks we have. We do lack water a little bit. You could Google, you'll see we have a couple decent sized reservoirs. There'll be ponds to some of you, but decent sized reservoirs where you can take a boat out or get a swim in. And then a, a ton of parks, a ton of trails, hiking, biking, camping, all of those things. When it comes to outdoor activities, we are all about it. When it comes to other amenities, Obviously, you've got every sports team there is. Football, baseball, hockey, soccer, basketball. I'm going to just say basketball. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just forget the fact that we have the Denver Nuggets, the current NBA champions, and I'm going to list basketball last. That just tells you how dialed in I am today. And then you have you know, all the amenities that you would expect of a decent size city. Uh, multiple, mu multiple museums, multiple art museums, uh, the Museum of Nature and Science. You've got the Botanical Gardens, one of my absolute favorite places to go downtown. You've got the Denver Zoo, uh, which I just always have to randomly tell people the Botanical Gardens and the Denver Zoo have amazing exhibits when it comes Christmas time. Granted, I'm making this video and it's still summer and like 90 degrees out, but when winter comes, it has pretty lights. And so there's plenty to do. I, I told you I would share some of the downsides of what is happening in Denver right now. Well, one of these downsides, we talked about the affordability challenge. Well, we've also had this massive population influx, right? Uh, m most of Denver, most of these metro areas saw uh, anywhere from 10 to over 20% population growth over the last 10 to 12 years. Because of that, many of these amenities, there's, there's just more demand on them. There's more demand at your restaurants and bars. There's more demand on uh, trails as you go for a hike. It used to be maybe you run into one or two people on a hike. And now, especially if it is one of the more, you know, busier, desirable hikes, you might see uh, far more activity on that trail. Um, and then, and from a cost standpoint, many of these uh, venues and many of these activities uh, the museums, botanical things of that nature, that price point can go up because again, they're, they're trying to deal with more demand. Now I've talked enough about the history of where we are. Let's talk about some of the issues that Denver is facing right now uh, and, and where we stand with these. And some, I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't see the answer and I don't think local experts do either. So first and foremost is infrastructure. So when we talk about roads, uh, we talk about getting around transportation. Denver has a, a light rail system and it's very useful for certain areas of town. But I say that, certain areas of town. If you're in certain parts of Arvada or Littleton or Lakewood where I am, um, if you're in a specific area of Aurora, you know, th the light rail goes there, you can get to it pretty quickly. But if you're not along one of those lines, it's not a city where the light rail goes to multiple neighborhoods. It has very little access going north. It has only one run that goes south and it barely goes past the Denver Tech Center so it doesn't get to larger communities like Castle Rock. So our public transportation, although it does rank higher than some other major cities like a, like a Phoenix, for example, I was very surprised by that, it's not gonna compare to your Chicago's, your New York's, uh, even Trenton. Trenton, New Jersey ranks very high for public transportation. Who knew? Way to go, Jersey. Along with that, you have our, our situation with roads. And let's just talk about I-25, our north-south highway, and, and I-70 running east and west. So I-70, uh, they've done some expansions on I-70, adding the lanes in both directions. And, and as you move east, I almost said west, as you move east, they had room to do that. However, 
As you move west, you get into this little thing called the Rocky Mountains, and it's a little tricky to add lanes to a highway that is cutting through mountains. The same issue, in many ways, exists with I-25, where I-25 cuts right through the heart of Denver. It doesn't quite go downtown, but it wraps right around the city, and it's in between the, the city and Empower Field or Mile High Stadium where the Broncos play currently. So when you get to that point of I-25 where it's cutting through town, there's nowhere that they can expand that highway. They can't add lanes anywhere. They can't remove that congestion. So it doesn't seem to matter what time of day. When you enter Denver on I-25, odds are you are going to get stuck in some type of traffic. If you get through it at a 40 mile an hour crawl, consider yourself lucky because for the most part, you're going to slow down, if not stop in sections. And from an infrastructure standpoint, there's not a lot that Denver can do about it. Just geographically speaking, they don't have the space, or the ability to make these changes. What will also be interesting for Denver in the future, and this isn't a Denver specific uh, event, this is something to be uh, aware of, almost nationwide, is water rights. It's one thing to see uh, a new area of development or you know you have a new apartment building or a whole new community to be, to be built. In order for that to be done, you have to have water and that is a challenge that Denver will be facing at some point in the future is getting water to access some of these developments that they have planned. And the last three, uh, really heavy on everybody right now. So crime in Denver, uh, you're going to see, statistically speaking, Car crimes, that's, that is break-ins, that is car theft, have been on the rise. We are among the national leaders, in not a good way, um, in these types of crimes. It's, it's, and I, I work, literally work with current law enforcement officers and they share information on that all the time. Uh, that's a problem in Denver. Uh, property crimes are, a, are an issue in Denver. Um, violent crimes have increased over the last couple years in Denver. We could talk about in areas where they're, they're starting to dip, but those are concerns. I will stress to anybody and everybody who considers moving anywhere, make sure you do your research and your due diligence on crime statistics and where things are occurring. Now you will find more often than not that crime follows population density. Uh, I always find it not, not humorous, that's not the right term, but Denver International Airport tends to be the second most uh, crime affected area. You've got a million people coming in and out of it uh, every year. But you want to make sure you do your due diligence. And I'm going to be real with you. These are concerns. Uh, car, property, and violent crimes in certain areas are a problem right now in Denver. And it's something that local authorities are really having to look at. So next, uh, we can't really talk about Denver without talking about the homeless situation here and kind of where we sit there. So uh, the homeless situation, visually, if you look back on Denver, you really start to see uh, an uptick in the homeless population in the decade of, of the 2010s. And really, I think I think locals, and there are some stats to support, obviously, that the legalization of marijuana had some impact on the homeless situation, but we can't be naive enough to say that that was the cause. Uh, certainly, you had more people moving here, not just for marijuana. You had more people moving to Denver, and at the same time, you had a pretty dramatic increase in affordability and more challenges related to affordability in Denver. Then, jump to quarantine in 2020. And this is really when uh, people will tell you, and we saw this in a lot of cities around the country, things came off the rails. For a while there, Denver, downtown Denver just became covered in tents. There were tent cities everywhere filled with homeless people. And Denver, I mean, I, I understand the local government didn't know really what to do with the situation. They didn't, in my opinion, they did next to nothing, which did not help. Uh, but this, this population grew. And so for a while there, you didn't want to go downtown in 2020 and 2021. At least you didn't want to go to specific areas. Around the capital, you would just see tents everywhere. Now, eventually, they, they tightened that restriction. You will see still uh, areas of, I'll say, like camps. You will see a stretch of road in which there are seven, eight, nine tents sitting on the side of the road still with encampment. Uh, local law enforcement, as I mentioned earlier, you know, working with, with some local law enforcement officers, uh, they're in a tricky position uh, that th at the end of the day, anything that uh, is in the possession of these, you know, these homeless people uh, is 
personal property. So whether it is actually something of, of, of use or value or whether it's, you know, I don't know, a, a torn piece of, you know, blank paper, it's all property. So even if uh, you're, you are moving an encampment or trying to help, you have to take into account all of that personal property. So it's very difficult for local authorities to enforce much. And at the same time, I think, I wanna be very clear, I think local government and, and local people are all about trying to support the homeless community and figuring out ways to do so. So from a living standpoint, and I don't wanna come across heartless here, folks, that's not my objective here. But just being realistic about people who want to live in Denver, the, the fact is, you know, in a perfect world, we want to see the local community uh, support the homeless. We want to see less homeless. We want to see these people, you know, getting the, the help and support they need. Right now, you, you just don't get a sense of it. I think it's moving a little bit in the right direction, but I think we have a long, long ways to go. And the last thing, because I just figure I'm going to end this on a, on a bad note, just get a bunch of comments for talking about crime, the homeless, and let's throw politics in. So I'm going to tell you right now, for any commenters, I'm not, I'm not going to get into any political, you can say, oh, liberals this, conservatives this, I don't just have at it, that's not me. What I am going to tell you is that Colorado uh, for a, a long time was considered a, a red state. For a period of time, it turned purple, as they would say. Uh, more recently, it, it, we have voted blue. Uh, you know, presidential elections, local elections, what have you, uh, Colorado, and, and especially around your, your high populated areas, higher populated areas, you've seen it leaning blue. Uh, that has had an impact uh, certainly, you know, it's had an impact on some of the infrastructure. And like I've said in this video, Denver has some things that are really going well for it, some things that aren't. That's the nature of any city. But it has definitely impacted the people that want to move here. We, we've seen uh, people move here for that reason. Uh, I think we've also seen people move away from here for that reason. Uh, I cannot tell you how many discussions I've had with people who don't like the politics of Colorado, who are looking at moving to Texas or moving to Florida and vice versa. I will get calls from people in Florida or in Texas who are trying to get out of that and, and coming here. So politics, certainly something that, you know, it, I am a firm proponent. I think people put a bit too much emphasis on, on national politics as, a, as opposed to local politics that actually uh, affect you. But that is something that is people are hyper aware of, something that I would uh, stress that you do your due diligence on as well. Overall, I think Denver remains an amazing city and there is certainly a ton of opportunity. You cannot look downtown without seeing multiple skyscrapers and multiple growth. Now, locals are not necessarily a fan of all this growth. They sure do like the equity gain in their homes, but they don't necessarily love the fact that the roads are busier, that trails are, are more packed, that affordability becomes more and more challenging, whether you are buying a home, renting, going out to eat, you name it, it's tougher. But the reason it's tougher is because of how desirable Denver and the Denver metro area remains for people living here. The, the multiple suburbs that you can explore and all of the different things and amenities that they all represent and offer to people. And the fact that on any given day, we are, I'm as close as 15 minutes to maybe someone else 45 minutes or an hour away from some of the most majestic mountains in all of the world, we've got it pretty spoiled. Denver has a lot of work to do, and that's why I felt it important that I explain what I could to you today. I'm happy to address any questions, any debates. I know this one was a little, little drier than some can be, but that's what I'm here for, <laughs> apparently just to be dry and forget the Denver Nuggets. So any questions on that, feel free. It's the perfect opportunity to hit me up. Your calls, your texts, your emails. I'm always the person answering those. This is Destination Denver, Colorado. I'm your host, Jimmy Everts. That was Let Me Explain Denver, Colorado to you. Until I see you next time, peace.